One of the scientists expressed this idea to me. Your novels, the novels of writers, not, not just my novel, I have one novel. A novel is a large-scale counterfactual simulation. So we too are running experiments examining the givens of reality. We set the conditions of our books. We develop our hypotheses. Questions arise out of our depths and we model them in language. A certain kind of reader is always gonna dismiss what we are doing as child's play. Stories are bubbles of unreality to them and thus unworthy of their interest. But a well-made fantasy will always disrupt the status quo simply by existing because it posits an alternative and it asks what if. What if is one of our most powerfully destabilizing questions, and in a life this brief and a world this violent, you tell me what more revolutionary activity you can imagine than play. I think about the authors who have exercised this in the worst conditions. Bulgakov lives under Soviet rule. He watches writers eliminated for their views, and he writes Master and Margarita, where the devil comes to town, and Heart of the Dog, from the point of view of a dog. Beckett responds to World War II's killings by writing pun-filled slapstick plays with characters who live in trash cans. Calvino critiques consumerism by sending nude ladies whizzing down Fifth Avenue on the hoods of cars. Edgar Carrot, living in Tel Aviv, weaves the surreality and the instability of his everyday into very short stories featuring talking fish and magic rings. Anne Carson responded to her brother's death by making the collage box knocks. My dad likes to say, you kids can only imagine because you have food in your belly, and he's not wrong. There are so many places where the minimal conditions for this kind of play are unmet. In a recent speech, the Uruguayan president insisted that even the poorest children in his country get a mattress because everyone should be able to grow a dream alone. And yet, as if despite Maslov, one of Uruguay's native sons, Felizberto Hernandez, wrote defiantly strange, defiantly silly, defiantly beautiful stories while living in the extremest poverty. Flooded mansions are navigated by canoe, a movie usher's eyes begin to glow. Hernandez took the fever of his hunger and he made something out of even this. He played with it, dipping into a richness that we still cannot fully account for in the language of markets or in the language of neuroscience. Jokes and dreams and games may be the only places, and I mean to evoke a physical sight where a certain kind of honesty is possible. Some of the best lines in our literature occur as parentheticals and asides. I really love when people say joking aside as if they hadn't just communicated, you know, the most brutal truth. Um, this playfulness must pose a double threat to authorities because the second they take such writing seriously, the, they risk looking ridiculous themselves. Uh, but I think these writers also joke for joking's sake. It's too simplistic to say that their playfulness is a red herring that permits them to say something truly meaningful. That exuberance and that irrepressible strangeness is an implicit critique of the homogenizing, dehumanizing forces, and they stage this critique in their own terms. Such writing waves a freak flag, it signals a freewheeling intelligence, and it says, we are free to move here regardless of our physical circumstances. Shut down the roads, control the news, imprison our bodies, deluge us with reasons for fear, and still we can move invisibly in every direction in the other territory. In these writers' hands, play becomes a celebration of every body's upward mobility where the imagination is concerned. And in a life this brief, in a world this violent, it can be a revolutionary act to take the scenic route. So play often feels scary to me because in dollar units it's impossible to justify it's a willful deviation from assembly line logic. And what I learned from these neuroscientists is that evolution designed us to be efficiency machines.